You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. Welcome to the show. The interview subject I have coming up for you is someone that I've been looking forward to talking to for a bloody long time. It's the death metal master blaster himself, Mr. Eric Rutan. Now, the reason for the conversation, the catalyst, is due to Cannibal Corpse's new album for 2021 titled Violence Unimagined. It'll be out via... Metal Blade on April 16. If you don't know, Eric is now a full-fledged member of the group in addition to producing the band as he has done, as you'll hear throughout the conversation for the past five albums. So we talk about Cannibal Corpse, but Eric's been in Morbid Angel. Of course, he's still in his own band, Hate Eternal. He was in Ripping Corpse. And there's a band that not many people know about called Alas. So many other things we discuss. Too many to mention in the introduction. So let's get to it. The man. One of the most important figures in extreme metal. Eric Rutan. Andrew, I'm so sorry, man. Brother, no problems whatsoever. You you must oh, know. I got three in a row and the first one went over like 10 minutes. And then, so of course it just kind of like piled up on each other. So my apologies. Mate, it's a good sign. You're, you're a very popular man down here and that's positive <laughs> of it. <laughs> nice to be loved, man. Nice to be loved. You are loved down here. You know, I'll never forget watching you in 2005 playing off the back of, was it King of All Kings back then? Or might've been the album after that. I'm Monarch. Yeah. I'm Monarch. I'm yeah. Monarch. Yeah. And uh, I was up front. I was so close to you, actually, that I could feel the sweat from your hair going onto the crowd. <laughs> and uh, no, it's all good, man. And I've got to say, it was the most intense performance this day I've ever seen. And, and I think people remember that about you, man, is that a uh, big compliment coming here. I think in, in terms of post-millennial death metal, mm-hmm. you're the man. And I think you're, you're the fella that's bought that intensity death metal for death metal's sake if you understand what i'm saying that ex- that mm-hmm. extremity and and i think people truly appreciate that about you man that w- with you man there's just been nothing else but just gold plated platinum coated extreme metal and everything you've ever done has been touched by the hand of midas himself i think in that regard <laughs> <laughs> you know i keep it i keep it true and pure and um you know i've always my music is honest, you know, there's, there's never been like an ulterior motive or an agenda or worried about what's popular and what's not, or worried about, you know, any of those kind of like existential stuff. I I'd always just kind of released what was inside me and been honest with it and uh, wear my I wear my emotion on my sleeves when it comes to my music. Um, and, and certainly I remember my first time to Australia with hate eternal, you know, I'd come to Australia with Morbid angel, um, but mm. with hate eternal, I remember that tour specifically. Um, I had my birthday in Sydney and I, if I remember it was my last show and uh, it was the last show of the tour and we were on tour with Psychroptic. They were touring yes. with us and I remember a couple of the guys came up with some drinks and, you know, I never drink and play shows. I mean, this stuff is so damn hard, you know, Um, but I remember they came up with a couple of drinks and and said something on the mic, like, Hey, it's Rutan's birthday. And uh, I remember the bartender like passed up some drinks to the crowd. Um, (laughs) And like, we were like at the end of the set, but we're like, ah, what the hell let's play another song. And so, you know, another song led to another drink and then like another song, another drink led to another song. We ended up playing like, I don't know how many songs that night. Um, and definitely by the time I was done, I had had a few. <laughs> so, I was actually, I was living in Sydney then. So that's the show I was at. Oh, I remember okay. that show. That's the show. Right, yeah, well, <laughs> It's a great memory. I have a great memory of that show. I remember it was packed and, you know, it was, it was such a cool show and a good memory and, I've had some amazing memories in Australia. Um, the, the first time I ever came to Australia was in 96 with Morbid Angel. That's right. And, and I remember it was not summer. It was not warm at all. We, 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 we had a day off in Perth. And I remember, I, I remember telling Trey, and we were like sharing a room at the time. 
I was like, listen, man, I'm swimming in the ocean, man. I mean, I don't know when the hell I'm ever going to get a chance to swim, you know, in the Indian Ocean. I'm just going to do it. And it was clear. And of course, you could see how beautiful it was. And it was like, it was not warm, but I just didn't give a crap. And then Trey was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, and I remember we were swimming out there and some of our guys were like looking at us like, what the hell are these guys doing? Nobody's on the beach. You know, of course, it's just me and Trey swimming in the ocean, uh, embracing, you know, everything that the beauty of Australia, which is vast. Um, you know, I, I, I just have some great memories. And actually, before I came to Australia, I had been sick with walking pneumonia. We we're touring America. Okay. And the week before we flew over there, I, I wasn't sm- I used to I smoked cigarettes for like 10 years. Um, and, but I got sick as hell and I was just rolling out of bed, playing a show, trying to get healthy before I had to make that massive flight to, to Australia. Um, and those were all non-smoking flights. And then actually it was that trip that I ended up quitting smoking. I've never gone back. So I have a lot of great memories of, you know, so many good things associated with coming to Australia, you know? Well, Yeah. It's uh, it was such a privilege to see you live. Then I was too young to see you. I'm, I'm 42, but I think it was just it was a couple of weeks I think before my 18th birthday yeah. that uh, yourself and Trey and Pete and uh, David, of course, performed. Uh, where was it? Up here? It was um, uh, the arena venue, I think it was. Yeah, and and look, those, those shows. Just to let you know, they're legendary. People still talk about those shows with Morbid Angel because that's that's really if you could call it Gen Gen Two morbid angel and that's very special to a lot of people that album yeah. domination mate it's it still stands up and and i think that for you to come into that environment with trey who i consider the most important and essential guitarist since van halen to come in with him alongside of him and to be issued standalone writing credits and that's the key thing there you're only a young fella but you got standalone writing credits on domination there mate um you couldn't get a better advocacy for your talent than being in Morbid Angel and having that credit. No, I mean, and certainly being able to write with Morbid Angel, um, it made my acceptance into the band like right away from the fan base, you know, is, you know, I was replacing somebody that I really respected and admired, you know, in, in Richard Brunel. Um, and, you know, coming into the band, I started touring with him at like really the, the biggest time of more of an angel covenant domination. Um, yeah. And so I think Trey really, you know, Trey and David and Pete, they saw something in me that I would be able to contribute. And I was able to write five songs for domination. And of course I have some amazing memories of writing the record and jamming the record, touring the record, doing the record. I mean, doing mm-hmm. that record was such a huge uh, experience for me, you know, recording it more sound, um, you know, I think November, December 94, I think is when mm-hmm. we actually recorded the record. And I was 23 years old. And I mean, you know, writing for Morbid Angel and, you know, that record really cemented me in, in, into Morbid Angel and people accepted me uh, with open arms. Um, and so I feel very grateful that I was able to be able to contribute in such a fashion uh, and write so many songs uh, for for that record, and uh, kind of interject, you know, who I am as a player. And you know, me and Trey were definitely a good guitar team. You know, very different players. Yeah, two of the but- best. Two of the best, actually, out there. I got to say. I mean, you you both complement each other so wonderfully, and yeah. I just I just truly hope that you two can can reforge that partnership at some point. When I left Morbid Angel back in 2002 or three, you know, for me, I just, I knew Hate Eternal, my producing, I wanted to put all my energies into that. Um, and you know what? That's exactly what I've done. I've done how many? Hate, seven Hate Eternal records, a live mm-hmm. record. Uh, I think I've worked on like 90 albums now or, or 90 something albums at the studio yeah. on top of touring. And then of course, uh, now joining Cannibal Corpse and and being able to write for Cannibal Corpse and tour with the guys and we've produced five records together at the studio as well. Um, I never even when I left Morbid, I I just never thought I'd end up joining another band or rejoining another band. I just was real. I've been really happy and and 
doing what I've been doing. Um, and, but certainly when this opportunity came up with Cannibal Corpse, you know, Cannibal Corpse is not just some other band. I mean, Cannibal Corpse is the freaking best. They're a, <laughs> a huge part of my life and my career. I mean, like Cannibal Corpse means so much to me. We've, we've known each other for 30 plus years, you know, um, produced five albums with them. My first Hate Eternal tour ever was with Cannibal Corpse. Um, more of an angel tour with Cannibal Corpse. I've done like, I don't know, four or five tours with Hate Eternal and Cannibal Corpse. Um, you know, those guys are friends. They're like family to me. And so for me to join Cannibal Corpse, it was really like the smoothest um, decision and biggest decision I've ever had to make where I just knew in my gut it was the right choice. And uh, they, they've embraced me and, and really wanted me to write and contribute. And, and, and man, it's, it's been a fantastic journey my whole life and career to get to where I'm at right now. When I reflect on things and I do interviews talking about my past and just thinking here I am, you know, uh, 49 years old and joining cannibal corpse and, and writing and playing on a cannibal corpse record and producing five cannibal corpse albums, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like this stuff, it's like, um, it's just incredible how far I've come from that kid that was like, you know, learning <laughs> crazy train or black magic or, you know, uh, battery <laughs> on guitar, you know, yeah. like Metallica Slayer, Iron Maiden Priest, you know, Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rose. I mean, those were some of my huge influences um, when I started playing guitar, of course. Uh, and to think of where I'm at now, it's, it's impossible to not, um, have tremendous gratitude and, and, um, I just, I just never take it for granted. None of it. You know, I don't think it's overstating the case that Paul and Alex couldn't have chosen anybody else. And that's what the greatest of respect to Jack, Jack Owen, that is because to your point, you have been around in the band for the past five or six albums, but the, the key here and the detail is you were part of their renaissance through kill. Now, mm. the band definitely stepped up a gear. I've been a Cannibal Corpse fan as long as I've been a Morbid fan, so early 90s. Mm. And uh, I, I definitely noticed that that big kick that the band had because I saw them on tour in 2006 as well, and they just seemed invigorated is the word, or reinvigorated maybe. I don't think they ever lost form, but the songs were, were back. It sort of went back to uh, the vibe of some of the, uh, the Barnes era stuff. But for you, having been around the band so long now, mentor, confidant, um, producer, go-to men. Did you have to adopt a different mindset when you were actually asked to step in as a full-time member? God, I'd love to say that it was like some big transition or something, but it just really wasn't. I guess maybe because we had been torn together already for four albums. I mean, for four tours and we've done four albums together already. And uh, we've just known mm. each other for so long. And we've known each other. I mean, Alex, to put it in perspective, Alex and Paul gave me Eaten Back to Life a couple of weeks before the album even came out. And so that's how long mm. I've known these guys yeah. and Rob and George from in the early 90s. Um, and so for me to come in and obviously I've learned a lot of the songs. I've watched the guys perform the songs in the studio. Um, it was just such a natural it didn't take much. There wasn't a lot of thought process behind me writing songs or joining the band. I, I didn't really have to. It was just like a natural progression and feeling for this to happen with those guys and with me. Um, and so it was just a very, man, I, I can't think of a smoother transition really in my whole career, like joining Morbid Angel from Ripping Corpse. That was a much bigger transition because, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, back then, I had done a record. I had been doing shows since I was a teenager. Um, but, you know, that was a huge step up, obviously, to Morbid Angel. Um, and joining during a time where Morbid Angel was just, you know, ginormous. And we were playing huge shows. And, um, you know, it was, we were on a major label. And, you know, it was like yes. the early 90s, mid 90s. That's when just death metal was just freaking huge. And so... Um, that was a huge transition, but me joining Cannibal Corpse now after all the experience I have and, and confidence as well as a player, um, you know, and knowing the guys personally and professionally, and um, it was just a really a smooth operation. And, and uh, man, I, I feel so um, 
you know, grateful and also, you know, excited uh, to be able to, like, when you think about like, man, I'm 49 years old and I'm joining Cannibal Corpse and <laughs> I have so much fire and so much, um, I still have so much ambition and, and things that I want to accomplish and achieve. And, and I'm so glad to be a part of this chapter with the guys in the band. And um, we have a great time doing it. You know, we love jamming and playing and hanging out and touring and doing records. And um, we all have a great work ethic and mindset. And um, it's just been really smooth and natural. You can tell. And, and because violent, on Violence Unimagined, and I'm going to take a pun here, I'm going to bet the chair I'm sitting on, okay, so a year ago, that you wrote Follow the Blood and Slowly Sawn. Because they, they, to me, they sound like as though they're part of that, that rich tradition of extreme metal and death metal that you've crafted over the years. I didn't, actually, <sighs> which, which is awesome. Well, it's kind of awesome <laughs> in the sense. It's kind of awesome. And let me explain to you why. It's because, like, to me, I really wanted – you know, that that's what's great about that actually and that that kind of leads to what i'm going to say here is that mm. the guys in the band all contribute to what cannibal corpse represents in their own way everyone is a part of this band um slowly saw an alex wrote follow the blood rob wrote so well, that's a perfect okay. example of guys that are continuously pushing themselves to create new and and kind of um inspiring things and like to me like follow the blood man i love that song the one rob presented that to me and it has one of my favorite souls in there that i did that i really am happy i knew that was you that's i think where it yeah. was i knew that solo was you that's it's just option, it just drips right? in your tent yeah yeah big time that has my uh kind of approach and, and i just remember thinking damn that's awesome and slowly saw and alex presented that to me too and i thought man that song's heavy as hell you know and mm -hmm. but it just kind of goes to show that um you know, like when uh, there's multiple writers and that's what's so great about Cannibal. You got multiple people writing and putting their two cents in and putting their own stamp on things. Um, it's a collaborative effort. Even if one person's writing the song or we're collaborating on things, it's the, the, um, the you know, the, the collection of everything and, and the sum of its parts that make Cannibal Corpse so exciting. And that includes past music whether it was pat or whether it was jack or bob russe or chris barnes you know yes. everyone made an impact in this band um and certainly with me joining the first thing i thought in everything i've ever done is i want to make an impact and you know when i joined ripping corpse i made an impact when i joined morbid angel i made an impact with hate eternal i've made an impact and now um my fifth album production with Cannibal Corpse and now writing songs with Cannibal, I feel like I've been able to and continue to make an impact. And um, I think that's awesome. And that, that, that even <laughs> the fact that I didn't write those makes it even more awesome to me is just because it says a lot um, just about all the people that are writing for Cannibal Corpse and, and how everybody really devotes so much time and energy into what we do. And hence why, 15 albums in um, the success and the legacy of what cannibal corpse continues to represent um, is, is imme immeasurable, you know? And I think mm. that me now joining and being able to add a kind of different element into the next chapter of cannibal corpse is really exciting for me. And, and um, I think it will be exciting for the fans as well. Did Trey talk to you about joining morbid for kingdoms you know i guess the thing is with with morbid angel i've never um i don't want to say i ever like i've never closed the door on anything in my career really you mm. know like i when even when ripping Cores broke up when i left morbid angel i never if i if if you're i don't know if you knew this but when i left morbid angel um you know they they found a replacement for me and something happened. And I ended up coming back in 06 to do a European tour to fill in last minute notice, like a week mm. notice. Um, yeah. And so like, to me, I've always kept things open, but at the same time, you know, when I, when I left Morbid Angel, I felt like I was starting a new chapter and I'm kind of the guy that when I make a decision, I move forward with it. And, um, and that's just kind of my thought process, but obviously, you know, 
more of an angel will always mean a lot to me in my life and my career. Um, and, um, but like I said, I guess that's what is so amazing about really me joining Cannibal Corpse is that I've had opportunities over the years to join other bands, to be a part of other stuff. Um, but I've always just really felt so great about what I'm doing with Hate Eternal and with my producing. Um, I just never, you know, of course I consider opportunities, but they just never were right. But with Cannibal Corpse, I knew immediately that it was right. And, and of course it makes sense when you think of my career, you know, Ribbon Corpse, you know, Hate Eternal, you know, Morbid Angel, Cannibal Corpse, those four bands are so key and crucial to my whole life and my career. Um, and I guess that's why, you know, joining Cannibal Corpse, it just felt so natural for me. Uh, whereas in joining somebody else or rejoining, it just never really was uh, in the cards to me. But joining Cannibal Corpse, mm -hmm. I just knew right away once it was presented to me that it was meant to be. And when they needed somebody to fill in, I kind of knew like, man, I don't know if they're going to ask me to do it. But if they do, I already knew the answer. Like, of course, I'm going to fill in. I'm going to help out. I'm going to do whatever I can to help the guys in any way I can. And um, leading to me now where I'm a, a member, it's just kind of a whirlwind. The last two years went by <laughs> like, like yeah. that. Um, it went from Hate Eternal as main support for Cannibal Corpse to me filling in the Cannibal Corpse to me playing and writing in Cannibal Corpse and producing Cannibal Corpse. It's just, it's pretty, it's unbelievable. Uh, and I certainly feel great about the decision. The one thing Steve Tucker said to me a long time ago, and I've said this before a couple of times in interviews, mm -hmm. is like Steve Tucker told me one time, and he's a great friend of mine. He said, you know, when it comes to major decisions, you always make the right ones. And I said, well, I don't know yeah. about all that. But uh, when I started thinking about it, I'm, I said, man, I, he's kind of right. You know, like I've made major decisions that some people even – had questioned in the past, uh, you know, like when I left more of an angel, a lot of people said, man, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're my last two tours when I was a member of more of an angel were uh, Pantera Slayer arenas and, and yeah, huge main support for motorhead. Right. And I was leaving <laughs> my studio was in a storage facility and Haiti eternal had one record out making not much money a night. And then, so I left, I left with a lot of ambition and a desire and drive to want to achieve the goals that I set forth for myself, regardless of the risk. I'm not risk averse. You know, I'm, I'm willing to take the gambles. Um, and it was a risk that was absolutely rewarded a thousand fold. And then yeah. to be in a position now where I'm joining Cannibal Corpse, having done seven hate eternal albums, a, a live record in DVD, you know, um, three more Redane jobs. I toured for four Ripping Corpse album, a last project album, and and now doing Cannibal Corpse. You know, it's like, I guess Steve is kind of right. The major decisions I've made have been the right ones. I think that, alas, and specifically the album Absolute Purity, of course, is an overlooked gem within your catalog. So, what are your thoughts on the album now, and of course, working with Martina Asner? Alas, for me, was something unique um, and special. And part of that is because I kind of grew up in a classical family. Um, mm. So to me, alas, it's kind of like my classical influence mixed in a metal way. It's like, you know, well, when I started listening to metal, man, I was listening to, you know, Maiden and Priest and Ozzy and Sabbath. And, and even before that, of course, like hard rock, like ACDC and Van Halen and stuff. But I grew up during the birth of metal. I'm 49 years old. So I grew up as metal was coming at us. And um, Alas was something that was a really unique journey. Um, and I never knew. I, and I guess maybe this is how I approach everything is like I approach everything at one album at a time. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard to do when you have so much stuff like me going on all the time, but that's what helps me hyper focus. I'm, I'm fortunate that I can juggle and multitask as I do, as I have my whole career, I can do multiple things. But when I submerge myself into something, I put the horse blinders on, I focus on that and then I'll shift to the next thing, shift to the next thing. And I just have that ability to do so. And when I did the last album, 
um, man, I put a lot into it. It was a lot of work to do that, but it, it the mm-hmm. songs came naturally. Um, everything about it was natural. And, you know, I've even written songs over the years past that first to last record. Um, but I've just, for, for one reason or another, I've never done another record and I don't know if I ever will. Um, and, and part of that I think is alas was very personal to me, um, in a way, what I put into that musically and kind of emotionally, I think I put a lot into that record. Um, and a lot of depth of who I am into that. And uh, man, it's a very special record. I, what, what fascinates me is um, I was doing a podcast recently and it was talking about my career and my life. Uh, and I was mentioning this. It's, it's crazy. Even when I think about it now, it just makes absolutely no sense what I did. But I recorded Gateways to Annihilation with Morbid Angel. And I remember finishing my solos on Friday. And then I, I hopped in a car. We drove uh, 1,100 miles, maybe 1,600 kilometers to a studio in New Jersey where I grew up to record the Alas record on a Monday. So I literally finished Gateways on a Friday and started doing the Alas album on a Jeez, Monday. And yeah. somehow my, my 29, 30-year-old brain thought that was a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to do back-to-back records, you know, like not a good idea, um, you know, because they're first of all completely different and second of all by the time i was done with gateways i was pretty fried um but yeah that's how i did it i mean that's just kind of how i've done things my whole career you know finish a hate eternal tour i remember finishing hate eternal tour in new york city hopping on a plane meeting morbid angel in germany and playing Wacken the next day i remember producing yeah. christine conquers armageddon in germany and meeting morbid angel killer job um, on that album by the way fantastic oh, job yeah. I mean, I do one thing and then shift to the other. And that's just kind of what I've always done. Um, but certainly the last album is something I'm proud of. Um, and there's definitely other musical endeavors I want to explore in the future that I plan on doing. Um, I really, it's just about maximizing my time and, uh, you know, doing everything I really want to do. And, mm. but working with Howard and Scott and Martina certainly is a great memory and, I'm very proud of the album. Yeah, yeah, killer stuff, man. So I love, I love, I basically think it's a, it's it's a, a unnatural successor in a way to Voivin from Thorion because of the work that Martina did there. I, I frequently will listen to both one after the other. Um, and Martina's uh, super talented and a great person, oh, man. And, uh, yeah. and certainly, you know, what the last was doing was very different than Thorion musically. You know, it was it was it was a a little bit more progressive, maybe you'd say like a little, you know, and it was just different, you know, it was different, Mm -hmm. very different. Um, So for Martina, I think, you know, it was certainly a challenge and she was up for it. And it's it's amazing when you think about, yeah, like, you know, uh, we're an American band with a singer from, from Austria, you know, it's kind of wild, you know, but so, you know, how I met Martina was because Morbid Angel was playing a festival with Therion and Judas Priest in Poland. And I heard her warming up backstage. And I remember I heard her voice and I just like went out in the hallway and, and met her and said, hey, your voice is beautiful. You know, you have an amazing voice. I actually have this project I'm working on and I've been having a hard time finding the right singer, but I think you would be perfect. And, mm. um, and that's how I started talking to her. You know, we started emailing and discussing things and then, she flew over to America and we did the record. Um, but that's kind of how we met was, was that uh, at a festival in Poland with the- her playing with Therion. Look, I've done 650 interviews at this point and uh, yourself and Trey, I'll, I'll confess, you're basically the guys that were at the top of the pyramid. Now I'm talking to you, man. It's a bit surreal for me, to be quite honest with you, having followed your career for so long um, and admired what you've done for so long. Um, oh, man. I, I think it's – allow me to make this point for a moment because I made it with uh, Barker, Nick Barker from Cradle of Filth and Demu. But, mate, what you've done is extremely important because us extreme metal fans, man, we, we sort of come from the other side of the tracks, if you know what I'm saying. We don't necessarily fit into society. You know, we're a square peg in a round hole, even if we have jobs and families and we're sort of getting by. And f- from the outside looking in, we look like as though we've got it all together. But the music is actually the thing that motivates us. And without that music, man, I think our lives would be would be devoid of colour. And, and I think, you know, what I said up top, I meant, man, is that what you've been able to do 
you've been the gold standard for so long that it's almost impossible to listen to other death metal bands and other guitarists at this point and not compare them to the work that yourself and Trey have done and say, does it actually meet that gold standard? And, and of course, oftentimes it's, you know, you get bands that are starting out and they've still got some way to go. But that's what I say to people. I often say that it's like, well, you don't just sound like, like Eric and Trey, but it's a spirit. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, man. You know, if I can be a part of the gold standard, that's fantastic. I mean, I certainly, when I started playing Morbid Angel, I mean, that's exactly what I thought of Trey and Morbid Angel. Mm. Morbid Angel is the gold standard. You know, at that point in, in the early 90s, um, I mean, man, we were doing crazy stuff. You know, we would practice six, eight hours a day with Pete and David. And then I would go to Trey's house and work all night, sometimes stay up all night and go to band practice the next day. I'd be up for two days straight during domination time um, oh, because shit. we got, we toured a lot for covenant. And then um, we already had set in place when we were going to record domination, you know, it was kind of like part of our contract, I think of when we're going to record. So we were just working around the clock and the, the work ethic of Trey and David and Pete. Um, it's just like, I just fit right in because, you know, for me, I was doing Ripping Corpse. I went to Institute Audio Research Engineering School, you know, when I was 19, 20. I was commuting to New York City every day, Monday through Friday, three hours of taking a train. And then I had a part-time job and band practice four days a week. That's that's when I was like 19, 20 years old. Um, and, you know, when I was, so I, I've always done multiple things and I've always had an incredible work ethic. And part of that just comes from my family, you know. My, yeah. my mom and my grandmom and my grandfather, my sister, my whole family is very uh, hardworking people. And that was instilled in me from from when I was young. I mean, I've always worked, always worked hard. And being in Morbid Angel, I mean, we were we were working really hard, playing all the time. I mean, I, you know, playing guitar constantly and, and working so much. I remember there was one point during my Morbid Angel, where I was doing Morbid Angel, Hate Eternal, Alas, and producing. I mean, I was doing like, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> and, and ultimately, part of why I knew at some point I had to make a decision on what I was going to put my energy into, um, which led me to leaving Morbid Angel only really because I wanted to focus on something that I just knew I needed to do. And that was producing and owning the studio and, and hate eternal and um, kind of focusing my energies on that. But certainly, man, you know, the, my work ethic as it's just always been there. It still is obviously, you know, I'm still doing, I'm still doing multiple things. Now I'm in Campbell Corps. Of course I have to minimize, you know, the producing, I have to minimize what I do with hate eternal, but at the same time, I'm still going to continue doing that and doing other musical endeavors because life is short. You got to maximize your life. And um, I said this recently, it's like, I'm, I'm rarely ever bored. If anything, I'm thinking, man, I wish I had like two or three of me. If I could clone myself, I don't know if we should have two of me, though. I'll tell you that. But can I find maybe there's a doppelganger out there somewhere? I can borrow him to like, you know, when I when I have to do the things I really don't don't care for, like uh, I don't know, you know, go for my doctor's visits or you know, uh, work on my taxes, things like that. I can have him do all that stuff. Yeah, Clean the studio, you. you know, <laughs> change the strings on my guitar. I don't know, you know. I mean, mow the yard, you know. I put I'll put him to work. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Or do the Agent Cooper thing from Twin Peaks and have an evil version of yourself out there. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I already have that anyway. So you know, I mean, all you got to do is see me on stage. <laughs> when you see me on stage, you know that's the evil me until that's I get the... off stage, and then I'm then I'm the the me the happy me. So like you know, it's mm. a balance. That's what's so great about death metal. It's like man, when I first started writing and playing music, I mean, I was a really aggressive angry person and and you know through this music it's been therapeutic for me to kind of i've been able to channel all this negativity into playing guitar and that's why you know you listen to like the music that i've written for decades it's very passionate and you know sometimes it's even too much for some people they can't handle the just the, the sheer the energy of it. Mm. And so, yeah, the answer, exactly. And I understand. I'm like, yeah, man, it's a lot, man. Imagine living with me. Imagine when you're me. You know, I live with this. And so <laughs> uh, 
but by being able to do this for so long and, and, and man, I've, I've reaped so many rewards beyond the obvious ones, uh, you know, on a personal level. Um, and, and like, you know, to be able to, I just feel like I've become such a healthier and more productive, you know, person by being able to do what I love to do. And, and, uh, I mean, how many people get to fulfill their dreams in life? And I mean, I had a lot of, I had a, I had a handful of them. It's like, I wasn't just happy, just like playing guitar or being in any band or, I wanted to have a studio. I wanted to produce records. I wanted to have my own band on top of being in another band. And like, you know, that's just kind of like my MO um, because I always felt like when I started, I want to make an impact and I want to leave a legacy behind of like, man, who the hell is Eric Rattan? What the hell is he about? Well, you know what? Um, when I'm all said and done, somebody will know and somebody will say, well, check this out, you know, like he did this or that and uh, keeps growing. It, it's not, you know, it's going to keep growing until I don't. But it, I, I think a couple years ago, I was like just reviewing, like, I, I guess, you know what it was? I have a manager for my production work mm-hmm. and it's about three or four years ago. And I had to start putting together kind of like an EPK and like a, like my credit list and what I've worked on. And that's when I first, I truly realized like, Holy crap, I've worked on a lot of stuff. You know, like I started layering out year after year after year of production work and, and albums I played on or tours that I did. And, and I thought, man, you know, um, man, I, I I'm so grateful for that. And then that feels so, um, um, I just never look back. I just look forward and keep going and keep going. And, and then, so to join cannibal corpse now, um, after even a couple of years ago, I was thinking, man, like the totality of my career, I've been so fortunate to have these opportunities and, and worked my tail off to get here. And, and here I am continuing that legacy now with cannibal corpse on top of doing Haiti eternal in my producing career and, and who knows what else uh, on the horizon of what I will um, accomplish or achieve. Um, I never lose sight of it. And I also know life is short and certainly COVID uh, everything going on in the world. Mm-hmm. It, it's a daily reminder of like, don't take life for granted and don't take people for granted. And that's something that from a young, from a young age, uh, I've had, you know, some tragic loss in my life and people that I've lost um, and some really tragic memories in my life that kind of shaped who I am as a person. Um, and I've never lost sight of how fortunate we are to be alive and, and to be able to have the opportunities present to us. Don't take life for granted. Don't take people for granted. Don't take the opportunities you have for granted. It's key, the essential keys of life. Yeah, very true. And and just on, on that very point you, you raised there about people that you've lost, and I hope we can talk about this. If we, if we can't, no dramas at all, mate. There's no pressure. But Jared Anderson, mm-hmm. who I think is another one of those guys who is overlooked by extreme metal fans due to his contribution, conquering the throne. It's just brilliant. The I mean, it's the, the you know, yourself and Tim, Jared, and then, of course, going on the Extreme Steel Tour. What are your memories of Jared? Oh, man. Well, Jared, great. He was a great friend of mine. It's like family to me. Um, the minute Jared and I stayed, and how I met Jared was through Steve Tucker from Morbid Angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, he grew up in the Cincinnati area, and so did Jared. And I want to say it was, man, I think it was 1998 that I met Jared and his band in Turnison was opening for Morbid Angel uh, in Cincinnati. And that's when I met him. And um, originally Alex had played on the Hate Eternal demo and I had planned on Alex actually tracking on the record. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just going to be me, Tim and Alex. Um, And, but Alex, because of Cannibal Corpse, like we were actually roommates at that time and, I think there was like almost a year we didn't even see each other because I was touring with Morbid Angel. He was touring with Campbell Corpse. Like we we literally were roommates and we didn't even see each other for like almost a year because we were both so busy. And it just like timing wise, we just couldn't make it work. And so 
I remember talking to Steve and he was like, you know, and Turnison just broke up, man. I was like, man, I should call Jared. He sings. He's an incredible bass player. He writes great music. And, and I called him and he was super excited about it. And he ended up coming down. And then, and then I ended up getting Doug on conquering the throne, which was not planned either. Um, All right. Okay. Yep. Because I, I've been, I've known suffocation since the beginning. They grew up in New York. Yeah. I grew up in Jersey. We've been friends since I was like 17. Uh, before we had record deals and all that and suffocation had broke up at that point a couple years back and i would talk to doug and i was you know he'd always be like damn i miss man i miss like anytime i talk about touring or playing or writing death metal shit he'd always just say man i miss that so much and i just kind of had this brainstorm of like hey listen man i'm gonna throw it out there if not i totally understand because he's like a mechanical engineer and he he kind of moved on with his life once suffocation uh, originally broke up. Um, mm. And, you know, I just threw it out there like, hey, dude, if you'd like to join in and write some songs for the record and and play on it, man, I'd be honored to have you a part of it. And they, he decided to do it. Um, but but anyways, that's how that kind of accumulation came. But Jared and I were like two peas in a pod, man. He, he, we were so similar in so many ways and we did conquer the throne together. Um, and then, you know, of course, King of all Kings is a record that me and him really collaborate a lot on. And he was an essential part of that record. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when Steve left more with angel, the first thing I thought to myself was, Hey, Trey, I know the perfect guy, you know, and, and it's Jared, he'll be the perfect guy to fill in, you know, and sing and play um, in Morbid Angel. And then that's exactly what happened. And then I ended up doing Jared's and Turnison album um, with him and producing it and playing solo on it. And um, I mean, Jared is one of my best friends. Uh, I mean, he was like a brother to me. And it's so essential, such a huge part of my life. Um, and I had so many great times. And when I think about every album he ever recorded, was with me and every tour he ever did was with me. And when I'm, you know, considering that his life was cut short at such a young age, I'm grateful that, you know, some of the last, uh, you know, things that he was able to do in his career um, and his life was doing King of All Kings together. It's such an amazing memory. And one of my fondest memories I have in my career is doing that record with Jared. And, and of course, Pantera and Slayer with Morbid Angel, um, Jared touring, and he was a huge Slayer and Pantera fan. And um, I guess when I think about his life cut short at 30, it's still yeah. hard to fathom. Um, and I still talk to his family and, you know, many of his friends. We, you know, we, I just believe in by continuously talking about him, it keeps his spirit alive. Um, mm -hmm. And, I have memories of Jared everywhere in my house, in my studio, you know, uh, photos of him and, and things that we did together. And I certainly from conquering the throne, King of all Kings, you know, touring together in Morbid Angel, um, doing his internist and record together, right. When I, in the beginning times of my studio, those are essential parts of my life and, and career. And certainly man, it's not a day that goes by. I don't think about them or, or miss them terribly. Um, but I, I tend to think back and just be grateful for the times that we had and, and know that the things that Jared was able to do in his short life were things that people dream of. And, and I guess he's one of um, a few people in my life that were are tragic in in the sense that they're gone way too soon um and i certainly it doesn't i don't lose sight of that or the gratitude i have for the times that we had together and um i think about i mean i can't even tell you how many times i think about jerry i was like man you know i wish he was here to, to talk about this or you know we would he was uh we both love nfl football and i'm a philadelphia eagles fan he's a dallas cowboys fan and they're pretty much arch enemy they're rivals they they you know anybody that knows american football knows the eagles and the cowboys they just they're just complete enemies you know as far as teams and yep so 
twice a year they play every year and twice a year jared and i would talk a lot of trash about each other's teams <laughs> uh, so um, not the feeling <laughs> And actually, the last the last conversation I had with Jared before he passed was um, it's kind of ironic, but uh, I was at an Eagles Cowboys game with my brother in law, and I talked to Jared like twenty times that day because every time we scored a point or a touchdown, I would call him and I'd say, "Ah, oh, man, your Cowboys suck," you know, like, and he'd be like, "Ah, oh, we're gonna beat your ass," and just give it some time. And I so I. I'll never forget, of course, the last time I ever talked to him. It just happened to be um, a day that I was at the Eagles-Cowboys game. And that was just something, a part of one of many facets of our great friendship that we had of of like, you know, uh, it's just one of many. I have so many great memories, but that that's one. I have um, his family gave me some of Jarrett's like personal belongings when he passed. And one of them is a guitar of his mm. that I have, you know, sitting over here. Um, and, but also gave me some of like his Cowboys hats and, <laughs> you know, it's ironic. Cause it's like, you know, if it was anybody else, but Jared's, I would not have a Dallas Cowboy hat in my house, but because it's Jared's, I have the Dallas Cowboy hat next to my <laughs> Eagles hat. And I, Of course, anytime I look at those hats, I just instantly think of Jared and I instantly think about the years and years of like just total garbage talk we used to say to each other every time we play against each other. You know, it's just good memories. You know, those are good memories. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, nice thoughts. And and thanks for sharing the two, mate. I appreciate that. And look, I've just got a couple more questions for you because I appreciate it's probably probably getting quite late at night over there, is it? It is, but you know, I, I live in the witching hour, man. I, I'm, I, my, uh, my thought process is metal don't start before noon. Like, <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> I mean, luckily, I can say that I have a career that allows me to not start metal before noon. But uh, I'm pretty much a night owl, man. I can't help it. It's just kind of I've been that way since I was a kid. My mom yep, always said, I was, even as a baby. I slept late and their friends would say, I can't believe your baby's sleeping until nine. And, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've always been, I, I related to maybe I was born at like 11 something in the morning and that's just about when I wake up. And so like, yeah. I don't know, maybe there's an association there. I'd say so. I think I was born at one or two in the morning, which is about when I like to go to sleep, but it's just impossible. <laughs> it's, it's just, imp- I've got two young kids these days and uh, I've got to get them up for school. At, I've got to get up at six in order to ensure that they get out the door at sort of 10 to eight. Otherwise, oh, shit yeah. just doesn't happen. It's brutal. Yeah, that's that's tough. That's tough, <laughs> man. <laughs> I, had, I had a chat to Trey's mum, Janelle. I interviewed her about a Ooh. year and a half ago or so and uh, for a uh, Drawing from my memory, she had very uh, positive things to say about yourself and Steve. But oh, she, yeah, she's, she's an yeah. amazing, amazing person. I've known her for a long time. A, lo- a lovely lady. She just comes. I think, I'm, to be honest, and I hope you don't mind me saying, I think Trey's very lucky to have her. Um, she's been a big supporter for him, I think, and uh, she just seems like she's, uh, she's just got so much unconditional love for him and what he does, and the people that are that are, are, are loyal to him as well. Um, is that is that is that how you found dealing with Trey and dealing and, and Janelle, of course? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, she's always been super supportive and and super supportive of of me when I was in Morbid Angel. Uh, me being out of Morbid Angel, like sometimes she'll send me a message or just say congratulate, like even like a couple of weeks ago, congratulating me on on joining Cannibal Corpse, and hmm. um, I think that's that's something that Trey and I share, like my mother has been such a key supporter in my endeavors in my whole life, you know, uh, two people that have just been so essential in my land and I can't even limit it to two, but my mother, my wife, you know, my sister, you know, I've had some amazing, um, women in my life, you know, like in, in my grandmother, um, you know, my mom is such an essential part of what I'm doing and has always supported me from day one. The minute I started playing guitar, you know, she just, she knew that if I was playing guitar in the other room, I wasn't out in the streets up to no good. And then before I play guitar, that's exactly what I was doing. I was up to no good. So um, she supported it. You know, she, she definitely 
from day one of me playing guitar, just thought this is a great thing for my son. And she's been to many shows just like Janelle, you know, um, my mom's come, she's seen me in every band I've been a part of, you know, Rip nice. Corpse, Auburn yeah. Angel, uh, Haiti Turtle and Cannibal Corpse, you know, she's seen me tour with Pantera and Slayer. Um, she's seen me tour two years ago with Slayer or a year and a half ago with Slayer and Cannibal Corpse. You know, she's, she's always supported me, um, and that's something I feel so, I mean, I, I feel so grateful. And I know Trey feels the same way about his mom as well. Mm. Hey, I've got to ask, because you've mentioned Metallica a couple of times there, but, um, and I'm not heaping shit on them and I want to be clear here, but look, I'm firmly in that camp, probably like yourself, mate, Master of Puppets, Lightning, maybe Justice, but those two albums, they're, they're the high watermark for me, almost oh, yeah. of all heavy metal as well. But look, they, they haven't done a lot in 30 years or thereabouts ever since black and i appreciate black was an uh, you know album it's an album that's standalone like um uh countdown to extinction from megadeth it doesn't sound like anything else in either catalog and it's uh the, those two albums catapulted both of those bands into the into the spotlight but i guess with metallica from a musical standpoint from a metal fan standpoint they never really sort of got back on track but there is one guy that can help them and that's you so my question for you, <laughs> well, mate, my question is, how about it? If, it? if it was offered to you, would you do it? Oh, man. Well, uh, would I produce a Metallica record? Correct, I would, yes. I would, I would absolutely produce a Metallica record. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's funny. I, I, I don't know why I didn't mention this, um, and I probably should have. When I, I had to give like a quote for the guitar world piece for the video, and I just thought mm. about it today after it was already done. Um, when I tracked Condemnation Contagion, the song in, in the studio, it's a lot of down picking. I mean, like I'd say 75% or 80% of the song is all down picking. So, of course, I just thought of the down picking master James Hetfield. I actually wore my Metallica shirt to the studio when I tracked that song just for like <laughs> inspiration, because to me, James Hetfield. Uh, it's such a huge inspiration and kind of sometimes gets overlooked in a sense of like when I'm talking about in, in guitar players that inspire me, you know, I usually tend to, you know, talk about Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes and of course, Kerry King and Jeff Hanneman mm -hmm. and Slayer. Shit. I'm not even playing death metal without Slayer. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, James Hetfield is absolutely in there of, of such a huge inspiration to me. Um, so it's kind of ironic we're talking about Metallica because, of course, the new song that I that we just you know did the playthrough for has a ton of down picking and it's super mm. like long, lots of down picking and and I wore my Metallica shirt just for kind of like good good vibes, you know, like to channel my my inner Headfield, I guess. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely produce a uh, uh, Metallica record and. Um, yeah, I don't know if that I, you know, that's a long shot, but absolutely, man, I would do that in a heartbeat. But I would, I've, I would love to. I would love to. I've never I, actually. I met Lars um, on tour with Pantera like twenty years ago. I met him mm -hmm. briefly, and he was a really nice guy. But I've never had the fortune of meeting the other guys. But I absolutely, you know, would love to um, meet them. But I did have the fortune, lucky me. Uh, a 14 year old kid seeing Metallica on master of puppets with Cliff Burton open up for Ozzy. See, Ozzy, these are the yes. luxuries of being an old son of a bitch <laughs> like me. You know, you get to see all the good shit. Awesome. Right. And so I, I saw Metallica master of puppets, 45 minutes set with Cliff Burton. I was, I think I was 14 man tops. Mm. My uncle took me and I had a broken leg. I'll never forget. I was a kid. I broke my leg and I was on crutches and he brought me to the concert. And of course, you know, Ozzy, Metallica, I mean, Jesus, like, you know, Dire Madman, Blizzard of Oz, those two records were, are like, gotta be, you know, I, as long, just like Ride the Lightning, Master Puppets, those four records are four of the most important records in my life in, in metal. If I had a, Hard to say top 25 metal records, but I can promise you that those four albums are in the, that top 25, maybe top 10 or 15. Uh, mm. But to see Metallica and Ozzy together, man, oh, God, those are, those are good memories. And I saw them on Injustice for All, but of course, seeing 
uh, Metallica with Cliff Burton is, is, a, is a really fun memory. And they just like, man, it was ridiculous. They were so awesome. Um, uh, saw them in the arena and, uh, but yeah, to answer your question. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, if, if, <laughs> if Metallica said, Hey, do you want to produce the next record? I say, absolutely, man, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's probably needed at this point in time. I, I think that they, they went, they, what was the last album it was a hardwired to self-destruct. And I, I did a, a review for a couple of sites um, and, and first listens, it was, it wasn't too bad, but God, it's not aged well. Uh, and, and part of that to me comes down to the production, that unnecessary bricking of James Hetfield's guitar, which I think is done if I'm not, I, look, I'm a musician too. So I've got a little bit of insight, nowhere near the insight you've got, but, to, I think it's been done to match Lars's overly loud drums, which he still insists on doing on the albums. And there's two or three things that I wish they'd tweak on their, on their recent albums just to make them a little bit more listenable because I do think in and amongst the overly complex arrangements, they've got some killer riffs in there, which must come from, from James, of course. But I, I think if you could get in there and just do, do your handiwork, man, it would, uh, <laughs> for, for, for old fans like me, brother, <laughs> it would be man. I like it, man. Dude, <laughs> uh, somebody needs to start like one of those online campaigns. Eric Rutan for producer for Metallica. Sign me up, man. Sign me up. I'm in. That would I'm be in. killer. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I was come talking... with, I'll come in with my Ride the Lightning shirt and, you know, and be like, all right, guys, let's do it, man. Let's do it. I mean, I love Metallica. I, I mean, I still to this day. I mean, if like, you know, I have like my CD case or something. If I opened up my CD case, I I have that I would bring in the car or whatever. Um, actually, my new car that I have doesn't even have a CD player. How sad that is. But, um, yeah, that's you know, right now. Yeah, that's how it works these days, right? But, man, <laughs> of course, if I open up my CD player, you know, I, I can guarantee you that Master of Puppets, Ride the Lightning, they're, they're certainly in there. And they get a lot of play still to this day. I mean, because I just – when I first heard Ride the – that's the first record I heard, Ride the Lightning. My drummer in Ripping Corpse, Brandon Thomas, man, we've been buddies. We've been friends. We grew up together. We've, been, we've known each other since we're like eight years old. And I remember mm-hmm. we grew up listening to metal, man. Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. Iron Maiden first record came out. We got the first Iron Maiden record, you know, in 1980. I was like eight or nine years old. Um, and I remember he – we were listening to all this other stuff, of course, you know, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, you know, Ozzy, you know, uh, Twisted Sister, Grim Reaper, man, all this, any any metal you can think of, we were listening to. And I remember he just kind of told me, he's like, dude, I just got this record, man, Metallica, you're not going to believe this shit, you know? And I remember going over there and, you know, he's playing the beginning of Ride the Lightning, the little intro, and then Fight Fire Mm -hmm. with Fire kicked in. And I was just like, holy, I had never even heard anything like that fast. You know, I was I was just like blown like at that point, and then of course I got into like you know Slayer, and then like a lot of the German thrash like Creator and Destruction and Sodom and um, other stuff like Exodus and Possessed, and I just kind of kept going heavier and faster and heavier and faster as the music was coming out. But but Metallica, I mean. Ride the Lightning makes such an impact on me. And I still love the production, the sound, the songs. But when Master of Puppets came out, it was like the ultimate, I mean, hard pressed to say Master of Puppets has to be one of the top 10 metal records of all time. I don't, I don't even know if somebody were to argue that fact, I'd say, how, how could you yeah, argue it, it? It, it? It'd be that or number of the beast, I'd say. Oh, number the yeah, the, well, yeah. number of the beats is top ten for sure. But I'm not saying the ultimate. I mean, I can't even say what's the best record. It's impossible. There's too many important records. But I mean, Master of Puppets, Number of the Beast. Oh man, I, I had the uh, I had a Number of the Beast poster, the Black Light Number of the Beast poster. Nice, you know, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's like right on next to my bed, and Iron Maiden. I mean, Iron Maiden is what really changed my life in so many ways and, and made me, um, I mean, I grew up, my, my uncle listened to a lot of heavy stuff. So that's where I was first turned on to like uh, ACDC and Alice Cooper and Kiss and Van Halen and mm-hmm. then Black Sabbath and Ozzy and, and stuff. But Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden had a huge influence on me. 
I mean, you know, one of my favorite bands and Judas Priest as well. Uh, just the guitar interplay of, you know, Adrian Smith and Dave Murray. Um, and when I heard Number of the Beast, yeah, man, because I had the first Iron Maiden records as well. I loved, you know, Iron Maiden. I loved Killers. Um, but Number of the Beast, oh, man. I mean, just the the first scream on the record when he when, mm-hmm. when Bruce Dingson kicks in. I mean, I just remember thinking, holy shit, you know, like that record is – there you go top 10 hmm. number of the beast you got to put that in that top man i guess it's impossible to even do a top 10 because if i think about number of the beast or master of puppets or blizzard of Oz or i mean judas priest jesus there's so many judas priest records i would i i just love as well black sabbath of course um but but you're right man i mean number of the beast wow what an amazing record. Every single song on that record is just the best. And I guess that's something I feel with Master of Puppets. It's like, I like every single song. I listen to that record from beginning to end, and mm. I'll repeat over and over again. It's it's really a complete record. Number of the Beast, absolutely, is just a complete record of just amazingness. Do you think Scream Bloody Gore or Seven Churches is the first true death metal album? I don't know, man, but I love both those records. I'll tell you that. I love Seven Churches, man, Possessed. Um, and I love Scream Bloody Gore, too. I mean, those two records, I remember, man, back in the day, like, we had this, me and some of my friends, we had this huge, like, boom box, you know? <laughs> and we just used to crank tunes through it, man. I, Man, we played Seven Churches through that thing, like, over and over and over again, man. I mean, just on tape and... Uh, man, Scream Bloody Gore, geez, man, when I first heard that record, I just thought, holy crap, that was just like the heaviest thing ever, man. I mean, they're both incredible. I don't know. You know, I know there's a lot of debate about it, you know, so uh, I choose not to debate about it and just say I think they're both awesome. I mean, Jesus, I, I love those records. Those are incredible records. Yeah, I've just written a book, actually, and I've, I've spoken to Jeff about this. And I've got to say, during the conversation with him, I agree, because he's very insistent that it's Seven Churches as the first death metal band, mm-hmm. uh, first death metal album. And look, fair enough, he wrote it, and he's entitled to that opinion. Sure. I tend I tend to feel as though Seven Churches, mainly due to Larry's guitar playing, outstanding guitar playing that he, that he contributed there, um, took it right to the very limit of what Thrash t- could still be called Thrash, before Chuck, and I know that he did some stuff with um, the guys over in Los Angeles or San Francisco, wherever they were from, yeah. um, before he went, he went to Florida, to Canada, to California, we'll just say, and then back to Florida. And whilst he's in California, he spent some time with the Possessed guys, and I think he learned a thing or two there and learned what he needed to do to take it one step further, just that one step further, and that's what made death metal, in my opinion. So I guess that's a question for you. Did, did you know Chuck at all? Um, no, I really didn't actually. I met him a few times. I opened up like Ripping Corpse opened for death um once or twice. I saw him on leprosy. We opened for him on spiritual healing. Um, but I did not know him personally, really. Um only met him a few times in passing, but hmm. um I didn't 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 really know him, no. There's very few rock and metal autobiographies out there. So have you thought about doing yours? You know what? I thought about writing down my memoirs, but I always thought to myself I wouldn't release it until I was dead. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's not hope that happens anytime soon then. <laughs> I know. I hope not. I, 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 I know that, that's such a morbid approach, right? I was like, you know, I, I guess my life story is so complicated and complex and vast. That's why... That's why I notice when, when I do interviews that are not just specifically related to one thing, I mean, of course, they're long because Jesus, you know, my career is is long. I mean, it's it's there's so much there, let alone my life, man. Jeez, before I was even 18, I felt like I had lived like 40 years of life. And so it's a it's a really involved story and definitely a story of um of someone that could have easily ended up not here talking to you right now. And so uh, it, it's an interesting story, but 
I share a little bit of myself when I do interviews or talk to people. I keep a lot to myself as well. And sometimes I think, man, you know, I, I've shared things with people along the way. It's like, man, you, you'd be amazed at the people I've met that have shared personal things with me and that my music inspired them to want to tell me these things. And I tell them a little bit of myself that I might not share in a public forum. Hmm. Um, you know, because I, that's my way of giving back to them for sharing with me. But I mean, I, I guess I've even had offers to do a book, but I always thought, you know, um, if I was to do something like that, I wouldn't want to candy coat it and I wouldn't want to, uh, I'd want to be fully transparent, just kind of like how I am. But at the same time, um, I don't know. I, it, it, it's, I guess I thought I should start writing down my memoirs because my I'm getting older and my life is is a really unique story and 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 definitely like a underdog kind of story of like me being a kid that man I had all the odds stacked against me to to make it in life let alone in my like lofty career goals um mm. but somehow I was able to overcome a lot of adversity and get to this point, but I guess I thought about it, but like I said, I don't think I would ever, I don't know. It, it, it's, I don't know if I'd ever do a book and if I ever did a book, I wouldn't release it till I was gone. <laughs> Look, ultimately I'd love to write Trey's book, but I know, I know he doesn't do a lot of media these days. He's uh I think the elude thing. I don't know this, by the way. I'm only guessing that this is what happened. But I think the elude thing might have might have uh, hurt him quite a bit. And uh, you know the way he deals with the media and the sort of questions and maybe some of these stupid comments that go online. But mate, he, he's another fellow because because Janelle did tell me that he's got Asperger's, and he does view the world very differently to say you or I would. But on that basis, it'd be far less a memoir as in just let Trey talk about whatever the hell he wants to talk about through to his love of fishing. BMXing, that's I think he owns a Dodge Viper <laughs> or a Corvette. You know, I mean, he's got all of these 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 things that he finds intensely interesting, and he can talk about them for hours on end. Because I've seen the you know the the private YouTube channel that he used to have, uh, where he'd talk about a lot of these sorts of things, and um, he he, <laughs> he did videos from the road. I think they were. I think he shut the the video the channel down these days because it might have got a bit too well known. Um, but yeah, he he's another guy, man. All of you guys, you know, Trevor Perez. The, the Tardy brothers, man, there's just so many wonderful stories there. And uh, the issue that I think I've got, mate, is uh, the publishers aren't all that interested at the moment, which I find crazy. Um, they're only interested in a lot of uh, maybe James Hetfield's book, for example, if that ever should be written, would, would they look at that? But I might have to start my own publishing company and get these books up and running that way and rely on some um, crowdfunding potential. I haven't even thought that far ahead, to be honest with you, but... Uh, you know, if ever you should change your mind and want one done whilst he's still living, I'll help you with that. Or you know, got <laughs> well, guys like Trevor yeah, as well. <laughs> I guess I'd have to do it. I'd have to time it right. You know, I'd have to do it before I'm dead. And then, um, you know, <laughs> like, like, yeah, we don't always have those options. I guess that's why I thought to myself, like, man, I should probably write down my memoirs while one, I have my memory, um, and two while I'm still alive, right? Because once you're gone, it's gone. Man. <laughs> yeah, but, that's right. I know that's the thing. Once once you're out, you're out. Once, once you're, you're out done, of the game. You're, you're done. I mean, like on a lesser note of importance, right? I just started thinking about this the other day. Like, man, I just need to start documenting all the shows I've ever played. And I started going back to like, okay, what was the first show I ever played? And man, I went back to, I mean, my first concert I ever played was when I was like maybe six or seven or five or something. I, I used to play violin. So I played violin for a few years when I was a kid, but really I just wanted to play football. I wasn't, I was too young to appreciate Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. Now I love classical music. It's such a huge inspiration in my life. Uh, but back when you're that young, you know, it was kind of like, um, you know, because so many people in my family play classical instruments. But uh, I mean, my first show as a guitar player, I man, I think I was like 15 or 16. Um, so there's so many shows. I better start documenting uh, so many tours. Like, oh, my God, you know, like, holy crap. I better start documenting now. Because how the heck am I going to remember all this stuff in 10 years? Probably not. So 
I guess that's a tough one. Yeah, for someone like yourself who's been all over the world and worked with so many musicians and so many different bands, um, the story would be so compelling for people. I think I think the thing that people find fascinating about you, Eric, is that is and, and I've already mentioned it a couple of times, but the quality doesn't change no matter what the circumstance you're in. It's not like you you don't have a a pile of shit out there it's it's all rolled gold and and i think that's the thing that people look at you and go well that's where it's transferable so bear with me here that's where where you, your story i think is one of those ones where it could even go into the corporate sphere you know how they like hearing about those those one-armed mountain climbers or you know the sure. cliff face climbers and all that sort of stuff but those books and they get those people in to talk to say corporate executives or executives of and boards and this sort of thing to inspire them to uh you know just human interest stories this sort of thing i think you've got an element of that you know i i've always i've had even a few offers to like speak at some schools and things like that you know dude you should do it man you should definitely it's all about time really that's really what it all comes down to is time but i definitely have a lot to offer um and I guess something I ever thought about if I was ever going to do something, you know, uh, you know, more, I don't know what the word would be, philanthropic or something, you know, maybe that's the mm. proper terminology. Yeah, community like, based. I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, to me, if I was ever like, there's a few things close to my heart that I feel like, man, I could make a difference. One is um, certainly I have a tremendous amount of respect for the veterans of our country. And that's partially because. Um, I've had some military family. Um, I've also, you know, I have um, some friends that have been in the military and I have a lot of respect for, you know, for veterans that basically risked their lives to protect their country. And, and the other thing that's really close to my heart is just troubled kids is because mm. I was a troubled kid and I grew up with some really challenging, difficult, traumatic scenarios and was able to overcome that, um, not without its trials and tribulations and without its consequences. And so I always felt like I know I could make a difference in that. If I was ever to do something else in my future, um, it would definitely be giving back to uh, maybe a younger generation of troubled kids or something because I, I felt like, man, they, you know, some kids they need they need help to get on the right path. I needed help to get on the right path when I was a kid, and fortunately, my right path was uh, who would have guessed, right? Like playing guitar, picking up a guitar, and just telling myself as a fifteen year old kid, "This is my destiny, and I'm not going to stop until I achieve my goals." And I, you know, I tell this story sometimes too about my principal in high school, um, and I never forget it. Mm-hmm. Um, he had told me, and this is like, I was probably 16 or 17 and it, I, had, you know, man, I'd been through a lot by that point. And they certainly, I never fit into my school. I was always, I always stood out, man. I was always different, unique and troubled as well as a kid. And so I remember the principal, he said, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And I remember telling him, I was like, you know what? I want to play in a band. I play in a band now. I want to do records. I want to tour the world. Maybe I can even own a studio someday. And I remember him telling me clearly, he's like, you know, you're living a fantasy world, man. You know, you're never going to achieve that. I mean, like your best case scenario is like working in a warehouse or pumping gas. You're not college material. Let's face it. You know, your best case scenario is working in a warehouse or pumping gas. Oh, wait, that's what you're doing now. You know, and I was doing like work study program, like my senior year. Um, And he was real, you know, demeaning. And he was like, man, you should just quit high school. I mean, you don't need a diploma. You know, I mean, you're going to be a working man. But this whole ideology of you touring and doing music for a living, I mean, you might as well just scratch that whole concept. And I remember thinking, I I remember telling him clearly, I said, we'll see about that. Because you obviously don't realize how stubborn a person I am. (laughs) I'm going to achieve this regardless of what you think or not. And I remember telling him, and I honestly, I wanted to quit school. Uh, you know, I mean, I wanted to just play music and I put all my eggs in that basket. But my mom was like, listen, you're almost done with school. Get your diploma. You never know when it's going to come in handy. And sure enough, 
you know, I got my diploma and, but I had all my eggs and ripping corpse and that basket. And we did our first record. I was 19 February, 1991 is my first album. You know, I've been in the studio doing demos, but that was my first album. And I thought, Oh, this is awesome. We got tour support and video support and all this. I'm going to end up quitting my crappy job and I'm going to go on tour and we're going to make it. And then six months later, the label went bankrupt and we were out of a record deal and we ended, never ended up getting another record deal. So that was my introductory uh, into the music business. And hmm. I realized at that point, all right, well, obviously putting my all my eggs and making it as a musician, I need to, I want to, I need to do other things because there's got to be something more that I can do besides pumping gas all day. Um, and, and that's when I went to audio engineering school for a year and learned the craft of recording uh, while I was still in Ripping Corpse and w- worked at a studio while in Ripping Corpse. Then we broke up. The studio went out of business. I ended up joining Morbid Angel, moving to Florida and years later started a studio and look at all the records I've been able to produce. So obviously that time frame shaped so much of my life um, because I stuck with the program. Um, but I know what it's like to be, um, down at the bottom, you know, of the valley and have to climb your way out to the top of the the mountain. And then I've been there, I've been down at the bottom and just climb my way out of it and got to way beyond what I ever dreamed of. I mean, I always thought, even as that 17 year old kid, I knew I was, I was going to, even if just sheer dedication and, and hard work and, and, and stubbornness, I was going to do something as a musician. I, I wasn't going to give up no matter what I was going to accomplish these goals. And part of that is because not only did I want to, but I felt like I had to in order to kind of survive music was my key to survival in my life um Mm. so the fact that i've been able to do and do what i do isn't surprising what's what's the most surprising that i've been able to do everything that i've been able to do and that it's it's just surpassed so much of what i could have only hoped for and and having these huge goals and dreams of accomplishing all this and then to be able to say well, yeah, man, you know, I, 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 what, you know, if somebody asked, what have you done in music? You know, well, you know, <laughs> done a lot, done a hell of a lot, but, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's so huge. It's so huge to me. And, and I, I mean, I never take, I, like I said, I don't take any of it for granted, man. I really appreciate everyone that's been a part of my life and career. Um, and that includes, every person I've met on tour or every person that ever bought a record of mine or every um, manager or booking agent or, or, you know, or, or PR or anybody that I've worked with in my, or, or come into contact during my whole career, man, I just feel so grateful for them. What a cynical asshole though, that principal was to say that to a young man who still had his entire life ahead of him. You're just going to be a working man's son. Give up, effectively. He's telling you to yeah. give up, ultimately. And, look, I, w- I went through similar things uh, when I was at school as well. And, and to be honest, I wasn't – I was. I wouldn't say I was academic, but I was, you know, in the middle of the pack sort of thing. So I couldn't understand where some of it was coming from. But they say that to kids, don't they? And kids, if they're sensitive enough, they take that on board and they lose hope. And, and they lose confidence. It's true. To put in perspective, though, I was a troubled kid, man. But why was I a troubled kid? Well, you, without me getting into it, you can imagine that maybe my childhood was very difficult and complicated, and it absolutely was. And so mm. I wasn't I wasn't born troubled. I just went through a lot in my life at an early young as a youth that I had to work through and overcome and learn some things the hard way and dealt with a lot of things before I was ever 17. I had dealt with so much in my life from my earliest memories. Um, and so to, you know, for him, he just saw this kid that was kind of out of control. And, 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 and up to that point, I kind of was, but at that time, I really was kind of working on trying to formulate a plan for my life. And I knew what that plan was. And it was, it was like at 17 year old, that was a time 
where I was really, even though I was so young, you know, like 17, Jesus, just a kid, but I already really knew what I wanted to do. And I was playing with Ripping Corpse and we were doing shows and, you know, we'd done a demo and I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I think he was judging me on past events. And, and so to some of that's understanding, but at the same token, you know, you're a principal, you're supposed to be a leader of, of kids, not yeah, like inspiring a, children. A, yeah, exactly. Leader, yeah. You know, but so, um, but I remember we had our high school reunion, like, I don't know, geez, crazy to think it's been, I've been out of high school since for 30 plus years now, but I remember we had a reunion, my 20 year reunion many years ago. And some of the kids from school were like, man, you should come to the reunion and just kind of like, uh, you know, the principal is going to be there, these teachers and other kids I grew up with. You should be there, man, you know, and just kind of rub it in. I was like, you know what? I'm not a bitter person, man. I don't hold on to those type of things. Um, you know, it actually lit a fire under my ass a little bit. Uh, you know, I was like, all right, well, screw yeah. you. you know, you're wrong. But I didn't use that as motivation. I was just kind of pissed off. Like, who the hell is this guy talking to? And, and But um, I'm not that kind of person to... I really try to not be a bitter, resentful person. So like I just said, ah, I didn't go because my high school years weren't the best. Um, but, you know, at the same token, I said, well, many people over the years have reached out to me and seen like what I've done in my life, you know, and I think they're just shocked. Of, and, and honestly, they're not the only people I'm, I am too. Um, you know, <laughs> like, like I said, if I was, if you were telling me when I was 17 years old that I would have been able to achieve what I have, I would have said, well, yeah, that sounds great, man. You know, awesome. Sign me up. But I don't know about that. But, you know, so but some people reach out to me. A lot of people I remember. Oh, yeah, he was he was cool or she was really nice. And and just say, man, congrats. You know, I get this once in a while on Facebook. That's what social media comes in play guys that I knew when I was a kid and they just reach out to say, you know, man, I cannot, I'm just so amazed by what you're doing with your life. Congratulations for all your success. And, and I always think that's just amazing. You know, it, it, uh, even if it's people that maybe didn't understand me, like my principal or other people that didn't understand what the hell is this kid about? What is he up to, man? And, you know, so when people reach out to you, I've even had people reach out to me like, Hey, I'll be honest with you. I didn't think you'd amount to much. I thought you'd end up in jail or end up like, you know, dead or something. And here you are succeeding. And I don't take that personally. I take it as a compliment. Like, Hey, you know, first of all, thank you. And second of all, I'm, I'm glad that you came around to see what I was thinking because really my mindset at 17, um, man i never even though it's obviously developed into something way more different at 49 years old but uh i mean i always had goals i always knew i was going to do anything it took to achieve them and um uh, i guess i still feel the same way like i mean i i'm like far from done i mean shit i i have so many more things i want to accomplish in life musically and otherwise and uh i don't know i think that's that's a big part of the spirit of 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 living and um i use my grandfather's example he lived to 93 years of age and mm. man he was doing what he wanted to do his whole life all the way up into the end man he was a hard worker you know um and was such a huge inspiration just like my mother as well and and these you know and they're, they're always young at heart. You know, my mom is really young at heart. My grandfather was young at heart. And I certainly have that, you know, I'm 49 going on 17, I guess. <laughs> I still have that youthful spirit. And, uh, but I have the, the wisdom of age. That's the one thing we get as getting older is that we get oh, yes, a hell of a lot yeah. smarter. And then, you know, uh, the, I think that's, that's key to life is learning from your mistakes and also, um, growing from them and uh, that, that that's yeah, it's not much more important than learning and communicating those are two really huge essential keys to success in life imagine if you could go back and be that 17 year old 
with the experience you've got now and imagine what your potential could be, could be at that point. I mean, it's impossible and it's always going to be a moot point, but I do it quite a bit and I go back and think, because I got to journalism quite late in life when I was in my late 30s and I thought I worked as an IT and telecommunications up to that point. Oh, interesting. And uh, to be honest, I, I hated it for most of it. It was just, you know, the customers are angry and often rude and hmm. the technology is is all, is all about company IP, Microsoft or whoever it might be, and they change the uh, the code once every 15 minutes. So you've got to keep on top of things and understand whether or not that it can integrate into a business, a customer's business environment, the CRM environment, this sort of thing. They're, they're, you, you've got to, at some point, you've got to be you, haven't you? But you, you are somebody who has been you from day one from the sounds of things. You've yeah. had that plan. And to your point, you, you just haven't been, do, you haven't used this negative commentary, but you haven't let it discourage you either. And I think that latter is the the key point with a lot of youth nowadays. We've got an epidemic around here of kids. You probably got it where you are too, mate, but driving cars too quickly and doing burnouts and all of that stupid bloody mm. shit. Well, well, they're starting to kill each other now. They're starting to get into serious trouble now because they've got these high powered cars and um, and uh, they don't know how to drive them because they just haven't been alive long enough to actually, you know, have a parent die like I have or have their heart broken enough. And they don't realise that life is actually fragile, especially when you're driving at high speeds. But someone needs to pull some of these kids aside. When I say kids, they're underneath the age of 25. So you know what I'm saying, sure. between the age Still of sort of 15, yeah, yeah. yeah, 15 and 25 and say, hey, listen, like, you know, youth is about trying different things and about backing yourself. And a lot of it, will, you know, will be if you look in a textbook, failure, okay? But you've got to keep striving forward and you've got to keep... Uh, Jordan Peterson said something brilliant the other day. He goes, if you don't know where you want to go, just aim at something. And as you get closer to that target, you will refine your goal to get a clearer vision of where you want to head to. And I don't think anybody has... Uh, he said it far more eloquently than I just have there. But I thought, oh, my God, if I if I if someone had told me that, when I was 16, 17 and 18 and when I first went to university and absolutely hated it and dropped out and sort of the only thing I had, mate, was heavy metal, listening to heavy metal and going to the occasional show because sure. there wasn't anything, nothing else going on. And I think a lot of people are like that, man. The world over from, from South America, we know how many heavy metal and death metal maniacs are in South America, oh, Europe, man. of course, America, you know, where you're, you're United States, Australia. And through, through Asia, tons of metal fans that are in Asia, mate. And you know what I find, mate, conversations with, with the leading lights of the genre such as yourself through to just the occasional fan who might listen, when it's a fan of yours, for example, that might listen to the podcast, we're all pretty similar. You know, that we've all got a fairly similar story. Um, and, and I think that's just to round out the point. I think that's why it's such a great idea for you, mate, with your wonderful story and with your life experience. And you have come good, man. You've succeeded. No two ways about it. You're a, you're an expert at what you set out to do. If people can see, mate, that you actually had, just to use the term, humble beginnings, that's ex humble extremely beginnings. inspiring. I use that term a lot, the hum humble beginnings. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's true. Um, and, yeah, life is fragile, man. That is the truth. You know, and certainly this year, if this year doesn't, wake people up to that reality then nothing will but you know i i i've had that i've known that for my whole life so you know i i guess i'm grateful for that um you know and also man i've never been afraid of taking risks and mm. um luckily for me i take more calculated risks now than say when i was younger i <laughs> I was risky, all right, but not necessarily the smart risks. But um, I've never, never lived my life in fear either. You know, um, you know, fear of failure, fear of success. You know, like I, I just, it wasn't really a forward adoption to me. I just kind of had to. To me, I, I, so much of my life has been survival mode, um, mm. and you know, but to get to where I'm at now, it's a really I don't know how many, you know, I think when I turned 40, you know, I remember I was recording a Haiti Eternal record 
and JJ and Jade were down here in Florida and my wife and I and JJ and Jade, like my wife asked, what do you want to do for your 40th birthday? And I said, you know, I live near the beach. We have a house near the beach and my studio is near the beach as well. I said, man, I want to go to the beach. I want to rent some jet skis, some sea dunes and just go absolutely nuts. Then I want to go to the Italian (laughs) restaurant, get some good food with you, you and I and some wine. And then we're going to go to the bar down the street. I'm going to get pretty pretty hammered and then Wasted. that's exactly <laughs> yeah that's exactly what i did i had an amazing 40th birthday and what i remember i was so nervous about turning i was like man i can't believe i'm be 40 you know holy crap and and the funny thing was i reflected on my whole life and i thought holy crap man i've been doing everything i always dreamed of for over half my life now like how amazing is that and 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 you know to feel for me, I'm a perfectionist in the sense of like, I'm always trying to improve and always want to be better, but it used to be just not being able to kind of hmm. embrace things. And, and, and there's been moments in my life that allowed me to do so. And I've grown as a person and a human uh, being and my thought process to become a healthier person, mentally, physically, you know, emotionally speaking. Um, and so I remember just realizing like turning 40, I was like, you know, man, I got an amazing woman in my life. I've got a great career and great friends and family. And I own a studio and a band. And I mean, you know, the last many, the one great thing about my forties, I'm going to be 50 in uh, June. And so well, I've been yeah. doing a lot of reflecting, man, of course, uh, you know, especially this year with COVID, like being home and just reflecting on my life. I can't help but just think like, man, you know, it's such a nice feel. And I'm never one. And anyone that knows me knows this. I'm not one to like pat myself on the back and say, oh, yeah, you're the best or, you know, this or that. But at the same time, I used to be that guy that was just never satisfied with anything. And 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 I would be so hard on myself, like, you know, I would play a show and mess up one note on a solo and I'd be miserable for the whole night or, you know, like I just mm. was really so down. I'm, I'm so hard on myself. Part of that is what made me who I am and made me succeed. But part of that was also contributing to um, kind of temporary psychosis of issues of, you know, lack of confidence and things of that nature. And, and I don't know where it changed or where it all went different, but I realized at one point that, you know what, everything I do, I give 110%. I never half-ass nothing. I mean, I mow the lawn, I cook dinner, I do anything. I do it all, either full on or not at all. And hmm. when I do the like album productions or I play a concert, I give everything I have. And that just is all I have to give. And so you have to accept that some days are going to be better than others. Some records are going to be better than others. Some performances, some songs. Um, but what I do with my career, how I treat people in life and including myself, you know, you learn from, from those, you know, same mistakes you make in your life or, or things you choose to do in the past you take and you just improve from them. And so I've been able to, kind of you know my my wife could tell you better than anybody you know like god I, I used to when i would do album productions i'd work 10 12 hours a day i'd come home i'd listen to what i did that day and and, and tweak it in my head a couple hours and i'd sleep i'd wake up and repeat and it would just you know at one point i had done like 11 albums in a row and i really got burned out and i and i realized at that point um and a lot of it was around you know, when I finished Fury and Flames, Hate Eternal, my 11th mm. album, and Jared had passed away, and my grandparents had passed away during this time. Mm. Um, yeah, I replaced the whole band with Hate Eternal. It was, it was, it was a moment where I took like two, it took me about two months to kind of like once the work was done, the record was done, and like reality hit me, and I had to take two months to kind of like gather myself to get my life back on track and that's when i realized like man you know you gotta change how you're doing things or you're gonna end up a miserable to um burn out and i don't want to be any of that and so i've learned along the way is you know what i need to do to to be healthy one of them includes taking uh time off you know like take a day off from the studio take a like if i can uh, unfortunately covid's 
ruined my my usual usually my wife and i will take like one vacation a year even if it's four days five days a week whatever um and just kind of like leave it at the table so now i've gotten really good at leaving the studio i leave the work at the studio i come home and i really try to um free my mind a little bit and and a lot of that comes from me i like to ride the bike i've talked about this before it's like i live near the beach so ride the bike and there's a bridge near me that overlooks the ocean you know and i'll ride the bike for like 20 minutes and then i just go up there and stop and just look out and gaze at this beautiful view and just kind of reflect on everything and and that really helps my my uh train of thought and how i you know my obviously my how i feel about things and um but uh i've learned i've learned a lot through deep struggle on what i need to do to to protect myself and be a more productive positive person in life um because i don't want to be some old bitter miserable i don't want to be that person i want you know i want to be a productive um you know, productive, happy person in life. And then luckily I'm able to create music that therapeutically allows me to just express all this like intense negative emotion that allows me to have like a more happier, productive life outside of it. So it's, it's, and, and combine it all together to make the person that I am today and be able to reflect on everything and, and uh, man, I've come a long way in my life for sure, man. And, and uh, still work in progress, man. Mate, I think you're you're approaching healthy middle age from a career perspective. You've got, mate, at least another 30 years ahead of you of producing the gold standard in world-class heavy metal uh, and extreme metal, I probably should say. And, and long may it continue, mate. It's, uh, I, I remember thinking back in the 90s how long could bands continue to play this type of extreme music? And if anything, Cannibal's getting better, especially now that you're a part of it, uh, with all due respect to Pat, of course. But the reality, the reality is, mate, I mean, you've got, you've got five guys in that band at this point where it's like, man, realistically, as long as everybody's got their health, you can just keep on going until you just don't want to do it anymore. And at this stage, it's not like as if that's ever going to happen. So we're, we're sort of staring down the barrel, mate, of you guys almost becoming the Rolling Stones of of extreme metal <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes i mean you know what and it's been every single person has been an integral part of that you know of course padding included you know such an integral part of the band up into me being a part of it and so for me um now it's it's my time you know it's my responsibility to help contribute to cannibal corpse's legacy and that's something i take very serious as well as like you know cannibal corpse I mean, man, I mean, it's such an important part of death metal and an important part of my life. And so I take it very seriously. Um, and I have I have so many aspirations of what I want to be able to contribute. And I've been contributing by producing for many years and now being able to be in the band and songwriter. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, man, it, it's, it's kind of like a whole nother outlook now i have for the future that i really didn't see you know like i i mm. did not envision something like this happening uh, you know it's it's so i'm still processing even and 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 you know it's just a whole it's so fresh to me you know like me being in cannibal course like whoa you know it's it's, it's just such a huge <laughs> deal you know yeah. to be turning 50 and i'm joining cannibal corpse and 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 i mean it's just man, you just can't even, you can't even script a book on, uh, you know, it's like, like, man, like if you're going to write a book about me, it'd be like, well, Jesus, where the hell do we start this thing? You know, like you start from my childhood, man, that, that will fill up. By the time I get to like being a full adult at 18, I'd have a lot of chapters in there, let alone my career. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting story. And, and, you know, uh, my career has been like, really amazing and fascinating and then i owe a lot to a lot of people for giving me the opportunities and i certainly everyone i've ever worked with knows how hard i work at what i do and and you know i'm a passionate person and i'm very devoted and loyal to the people that i work with and um 
always will be, you know, that, that will never change loyalty and commitment and integrity and hard work and dedication. Those are, those are some of the attributes um, that I, I certainly um, attribute to, to the person that I am. Mm. The last time I used the word legend was when I was talking to Michael Girard from Swans and I got a firm rebuke from him, but I've got to use it with you, mate. You are a legend of what we all love. Um, and uh, because of, because of you, mate, we, we, we all have something that we cherish, which is so important to us, mate. So yeah, it's, uh, mate, it's, it's been a privilege to chat to you. I've got to say, um, yeah, you, can, you can tell it, I'm a fan and, and I just, I've loved what you've been doing ever since I picked up domination back in the day. And uh, <laughs> saw your picture and wondered who this fella was and, and got to know you through um, hate work and just so many of the other great cuts that you contributed to Domination. And, and then Conquering the Throne, which is one of my all-time favourite death metal albums as well, I've got to say, you just absolutely floored me with that. It's just an intense mm-hmm. masterpiece and the most intense death metal album I think potentially ever written. If it, I, I often say to people, if you want to hear the heaviest album ever written, that's Conquering <laughs> the Throne. Wow, wow. <laughs> Well, man, that's a hell of a compliment, man. I appreciate it. And, you know, um, compliments, they never get old for sure. And they're hard to, uh, like, I mean, I get so many compliments. I get so much, you know, man, I'm just like, I just feel like such a normal, like, you know, kid that loves metal. And I, I, I never, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 you know, the more I do this, the more I'm around, the more I become like integrated with the music that I've been a part of for so long. Mm. Um, it's funny that like, you know, accepting compliments is, is like, it's so like, I can handle criticism probably better than I can handle. compliments. <laughs> it's a foreign concept, isn't it? When you get, when you get positive feedback, isn't it? Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, I guess so. You know, and I, it, but it, I appreciate it so much. And, and it, you know, it's like, you mean, you know, you think about like all the years you work to get to this point and, and, you know, when people, what you've done, um, that interplay in that relationship, you know, like we're sometimes I go on meeting somebody like yourself. That's like, Hey man, domination changed my life. I call you a domination to meet my 15 year old kid, you know, like, and, yes. I'm, and, I'm, and he's interested <laughs> in this kid to like, you know, hate eternal or something. It just blows my mind. You know, I'm meeting now I'm meeting multiple generations of families um, into music that I've been doing for, for decades. Uh, and I find it fascinating. It's just so humbling. You know, it's, it, it, it's, um, I think the more, the more you do in your life, the more you accomplish, the more humble I've become and just grateful for, everything I have and everything I've been able to do and the people I've come in contact with and all the memories that I have that are just so vast. Um, and, and God, when I was a teenager, I don't know if I ever even thought I'd ever lived to 30. Like, I don't think I, like when I was 17, <laughs> I probably never even thought about 30, let alone. Or I remember, I remember thinking the same. Yeah. Oh, you can't envision yeah. it. And you know, I mean, I'm going to be 50 and I think to myself, man, I'm far from done. I'm not even, I haven't even touched the surface. I, I have so much more to offer, not only in music, but in the, in life in general, I think. And, mm. and I, I, there's so much resource I haven't even tapped into yet. Um, I, and I'm always learning new things. Like I, like that guitar playthrough. I shot that myself, believe it or not. And I have no knowledge about cameras or nothing. I don't know crap. And but because of COVID-19, I was not able to go to the guitar world office and New York's are closed down. And it was like, well, if you want to attempt this yourself, you know, we can do it. And I said, let's do it, man. And so uh, my wife bought me an early birthday present, got me the, a nice camera. Mm-hmm. And then I bought all this lighting and all this stuff. And my good friend, Keith Marrow, who shot my Hate Eternal playthrough, and Vince Edwards from Metal Blade, who edited the video, they were instrumental in helping me understand the principles of shutter speed, aperture, you know, like, I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, all these, all these different things, learning the camera and all this stuff that was so foreign to me. I don't know if I've taken on anything like that where I didn't understand it. You know, I've been recording records and using Pro Tools and I come from tape. I have a really good understanding of guitar and, and recording, but camera 
geez, I've never owned a camera like that. So I spent a month learning that and then learning what looks good in the studio and the proper lighting, let alone playing the song. Right. And um, I learned so much. And then Vince, luckily from Metal Blade, edited it for me and it came out great. It came out today. And I thought, wow, you know, it was rewarding to see because I was worried. I was like, man, I just want it to be killer. And, <laughs> and it came out pretty good. And it just goes to show, man, you're never too old to learn new tricks. Indeed, correct. Yeah, yeah. A lot of talent there, though, mate. That's the other thing, too. Yeah. Well, brother, Thanks so look, much thank you. It's a pleasure talking with you, man. It is. It's likewise, man. It's. Uh, I've said it so many times, man. And uh, every time I talk to the, you, you guys, you know, you leading lights, you legends. It's just such a wonderful conversation, and I'm so flattered that you take the time out to have a conversation with someone like myself, man. So thank you. My pleasure, man. And you take care of yourself and. Um, wish you and your family nothing but health and happiness man be careful out there and just man i hope to see you down under someday in the future man fingers crossed we can do that it'll either be that or i'll go to um psycho fest or something like that in las vegas and hopefully you guys will be on it whenever we can travel yeah. over there again i'll do that god i can't <laughs> wait to be able to play on a stage again man i'll tell you but oh, um, one step at a time man one day at a time right you know just Everybody does their part. We can get past this, man. And yeah. That's a lot of things in life. So I think we can get past this too. That was a conversation with Eric Rutan from Hate Eternal, Morbid Angel, Alas, Ripping Corpse, and now Cannibal Corpse. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Truly hope you enjoyed that one. I know I enjoyed it immensely. So thanks so much for tuning in.